Our next speaker is spectacular. I am so glad to see uh, the room so full because this topic is so near and dear to my heart. You really want to learn how to heal Crohn's, colitis, celiac disease, candida. You want to heal the gut naturally. And that's why our next speaker is really going to be speaking to how you can truly heal dysbiosis where the digestive lining, the ecology of the good bacteria and yeast is often thrown out of balance by using things like antibiotics. And how can we bring that back into balance? And the great thing is, is once we bring that back into balance, not only do we heal the gut and all of the issues with the gut, but we've really learned that we also heal the brain. And we really bring about a tremendous happy feeling. So I think that this is probably one of the most important lecture topics we could possibly talk about at the Whole Life Expo, so good work for bringing it up. So I really want you to put your hands together, but first off, I'm going to say if you want to speak with Amanda, she's going to be at NACA Herbs and Vitamins, which is booth 238 to answer all your questions. And now let's make some noise, give her good energy, absolutely. Thank you so much for coming, Amanda Burke, amazing. Thank you, Julia. It was a wonderful introduction from the digestive care expert, so that's very nice. And welcome to my talk on help for Crohn's, colitis, celiac, and candida, how to heal the gut naturally. Today we're going to talk about a lot of interesting things. First I'll say I'm a certified holistic nutritionist and life extension expert, and I am with NACA Herbs and Vitamins, so we can chat at the booth after the talk. I'll be moving fairly quickly to get through as much material as possible, so don't worry if you can't take notes or maybe you thought you missed something. You can all have this entire presentation after the show emailed to you. Just come to the booth and give your name. Today, in particular, we'll be discussing natural strategies for a healthy gut, natural alternatives to drugs, antibiotics, and surgery, and we'll go in-depth into how good intestinal flora can support digestive health. When we go back to the beginnings of modern medicine, we find Hippocrates, the Greek physician, and he's considered the father of modern medicine. And he famously stated that all disease begins in the gut. So while we're talking about digestive diseases in particular, pretty much any disease that you come across has a gut connection, and you need to start to heal the gut before you can focus in on other specifics of the disease. Uh, important to discuss is the microbiome, so that's what we're going to start off with. But I just want to say that the rates of chronic inflammatory bowel disease are unfortunately climbing every year, particularly in North America. There is the impact of irritable bowel disease report that was released in 2012 by Crohn's and Colitis Canada. This report was consider, uh, considered a landmark document, and it revealed that approximately 233 1,000 Canadians suffer with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Crohn's and colitis are twice as common as multiple sclerosis or HIV and about as prevalent as epilepsy and type 1 diabetes. From this study, one of the most troubling findings was that the prevalence of Crohn's and colitis in children under 10 uh, was increasing quite significantly, with an estimated 5,900 Canadian children affected. So it hits younger and younger populations. Some of that has to do with early antibiotic exposure. Sometimes there's a traumatic pregnancy and the child is put on intravenous antibiotics, and we're exposing children earlier and earlier to pharmaceutical drugs. So first, what is the microbiome? Some of you have maybe come across this term before. Here's the definition. Your microbiome is made up of the total community of microorganisms that live in your body. And the vast majority of these microorganisms live and reside in your gut. Current research estimates that over 10 trillion bacteria reside in the gut. And just like our fingerprints, the makeup of the microbiome is unique to individual, each individual, which is why a holistic approach is usually much better than an allopathic approach, which tends to treat every single person with the same disease as the exact same. Many of these organisms are harmless, and they are known as commensal cells, and the majority of these organisms are actually beneficial to us, and they are known as symbionts. And that's because they live in harmony with us or symbiotic, symbiotically with us. Said another way, a microbiome is the ecological community of commensal, symbiotic, and pathogenic microorganisms that share our body space. So we play host to many of these little guys. 
Now, there are two competing theories about why we take on pathogenic microorganisms which contribute to disease states. By the way, this is what they look like. They're all just hanging out in your gut right now. Uh, so there's two competing theories. Most of us are familiar with germ theory, which kind of leaves us a little bit vulnerable. It says that if you're exposed to a bacteria or a mold or a yeast or a virus, then you are going to um, be exposed to sickness and have a decline in your health. And everybody's sort of susceptible um, in the same way. However, there's another theory which says actually the Milo is everything. And the Milo comes from a gentleman named Bernard. And he, he was a French physician. And the Milo was Milo interior, or interior Milo. It's another way of saying the environment within, or homeostasis, or the wisdom of the body. And he said the Milo is absolutely everything. And that actually puts you into power, because if you can control the Milo, you can control what type of organisms uh, proliferate, and you can keep everything in balance. So he said that bacteria only develop according to the Milo. A Milo unsuitable for bacteria doesn't allow specific bacteria cultures to thrive. So we're going to talk about how we can modify the Milo so that good bacteria proliferate and the bad guys stay in check. So what determines your gut Milo? Dietary factors, excesses and deficiencies, an excess of sugar, an excess of too much protein, um, excess of toxins like alcohol and caffeine, too much caffeine, and then deficiencies, deficiencies like fiber deficiency or micronutrient deficiencies or water deficiency can modify and shape the Milo. Stress, of course, toxicity, heavy metals, DDT, PCBs, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, all the things that our ancestors were really not exposed to because they worked more in harmony with their environment. Emotional burden affects the Milo. Environmental factors, toxicity, versus are you in a harmonic environment where you feel supported and connected to other people? And then our defense mechanisms. Do you have a weak immune system versus a very strong immune system? And the health of the elimination channels. What is your capacity to detoxify these harmful substances coming in through the air we're breathing, the water that we're drinking, and the food we're eating? How fast can you eliminate that out of the system through the lymphatic system, your kidneys, the respiratory organs, the skin, and the digestive system? So this idea of the Milo being everything is tied into a concept called pleomorphism. So there are many microorganisms that exist in, harmon in a harmonious way in our gut that are um, in us right now. And they do not start to produce disease unless they pleomorph into their more pathogenic form. An example of this would be candida, which we'll talk about today. We all have candida albicans living in our guts. If everything is in balance or in harmony, it doesn't cause any negative health consequences. However, it can pleomorph and change into its fungal form, and that causes illness and disease. So this has to do with the research of Dr. Pierre Beauchamp. It was followed by Dr. Claude Bernard. And then it culminated in the work of the German researcher, Dr. Enderlein. And he formed the overall theory known as pleomorphism. So again, this theory posits that under toxic conditions, otherwise harmless components living within a cell can then transform and be restructured into viruses, pathogenic bacteria, mold, and fungus. Uh, that is the wrong spelling of mold. Take out the U. Um, so we have the, we have, everybody has cancer genes. Are they turned on or off? Um, sometimes we can be exposed to Lyme, but whether it changes shape and size and pleomorphs into its pathogenic form determines, of whether, determines whether or not we are affected. Another way of saying this is that in Enderlein's theory, the micro world of bacteria are understood as symbionts. They are otherwise harmless and coexisting symbiotically with other microorganisms comprising the human microbiome. And it's only when the Milo changes do they develop into pathogenic forms and because disease causing. So simplic simplicity is that they're harmless, but they can become harmful when the conditions allow that to be the case. Let's talk about leaky gut syndrome. It's another contributing factor to the chronic inflammatory bowel diseases. Here's a nice diagram which shows you the difference between healthy intestinal tissue and a intestinal tract that has become quote unquote leaky on your 
left, you see healthy tissue. The cells between the intestinal tract, they are very nice and tightly knit together. There's not big gaping holes or spaces between them that would allow the contents of the bowel to filter into the bloodstream. If you eat a diet like you see on the left, with lots of roughage and fiber and low toxicity and as little pharmaceutical drugs as possible, then that tissue can be healthy. When we're over-consuming what's on the right side of the diagram, too much fast food, too much drugs and alcohol, too much refined sugars and carbohydrates, then inflammation results, and over time, the spaces between the intestinal cells become wider and wider and wider, and that's where we get the term leaky gut. Because you don't want full-size food particles that have not been properly broken down. You don't want pathogens from the bowel leaking into the bloodstream without first being taken care of um, in the gut. And you don't want poisons from uh, fungus leaking directly into the bloodstream. So there's a lot of things that end up in the blood that just should not be there. So what are the effects of a leaky gut? The first one is hormonal imbalance. Toxins leaking into the bloodstream, which find their way to the thyroid and the hypothalamus in the brain, um, have an impact on the way the rest of the endocrine system functions. So you might get a diagnosis about an endocrine imbalance that's actually rooted in the gut. Autoimmunity, of course, Crohn's disease. Chemical and food sensitivities are directly linked to a leaky gut. Environmental and food allergies. So what can happen is that leaky gut can be um, misdiagnosed as other diseases. And your doctor may not immediately make the correlation between gut health and something that is affecting the immune system or the hormone and endocrine system or the way that you're able to deal with different types of foods. The health of your gut has a direct impact on the health of your mental state. So a lot of symptoms of living with chronic inflammatory bowel disease or candida yeast infection or a digestive disturbance of any kind can be emotional impacts and, and mental impacts. Um, here's a nice diagram showing all the different bugs in our gut going to work on the mind, just to give you a visual. A lot of times you don't think about the brain and the bowel connection, but they're so intricately linked. In fact, when you are a fetus and you're in the womb, the first brain to develop is actually in your gut. This brain develops after that. So these are the critters that uh, are impacting how we think and how we feel. The reasons why they have this impact are if you have a lot of mold, yeast, and fungus in the gut, those produce mycotoxins, toxins made by fungus. And mycotoxins can cross through the blood-brain barrier, causing symptoms like brain fog, an inability to focus or think, a worsening of you know, the memory, and uh, even in some cases, it's been linked to mental illness. Excitotoxins, which come from food, from MSG to your aspartame, they can then leak directly into the bloodstream if you have a leaky gut, and they also cross through the blood-brain barrier and have an impact on your ability to think clearly. Uh, B12 is synthesized in the gut, and it's also absorbed in the gut, plus all your other B-complex vitamins need to be absorbed in the gut, and they are crucial for the synthesis of neurotransmitters. Um, serotonin, about 70% of your serotonin is actually manuf manufactured in your gut. And so not only that, but then we need it to be properly absorbed from the gut so that it can circulate and give us that good feeling state that serotonin is known for. So what can be done? First, we will talk about probiotics. But before we talk about probiotics, we have to talk about how the gut flora gets imbalanced in the first place some comedic relief. This gentleman is saying, well, my intestinal flora are looking rather rosy. And this lady is saying, I was talking about intestinal flora, Billy. Ha, 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 ha. Um, we can't take all of this too seriously because it will stress us out. What are the causes of imbalanced gut flora? So the first one, a big one, is antibiotics. They are being over-prescribed today. The birth control pill, which feeds yeast in the gut because yeast love a high estrogen environment. Sugar, which feeds yeast in the gut. Caffeine and alcohol, which reduce good intestinal microflora. Chlorinated water, which kills things like cryptosporidium and giardia in our tap water. But then when we're drinking tap water, that actually kills off our good intestinal flora. Parasites, mold, yeast, and fungal overgrowth, given the right conditions. 
stress, and a low-fiber Western diet is a huge component of why we get the balance off in our gut. This is a convenient way of thinking about the balance of good bacteria to bad bacteria. We have the good bacteria, most of it is bifidobacterium and lactobacillus, and then we have their various species, and then we have what's considered bad bacteria. That's your mold, your yeast, and your fungus, the disease-causing agents that live in the gut if the conditions are right for that. So let's talk about antibiotics and their overprescription in modern medicine. The Center for Disease Control, uh, the, yeah, the Center for Disease Control warns that 90% of upper respiratory infections, including children's ear infections, are actually viral, so they're not bacterial. And 90% is a huge number, except antibiotics are being prescribed for them, and antibiotics do not treat viral infection. More than 40% of about 50 million prescriptions for antibiotics each year in physicians' offices were inappropriate. And that is documented by Dr. Carolyn Dean, a medical doctor who wrote Death by Modern Medicine. There's a lot of great statistics in that book if you're looking for a, a good but heavy read. So using antibiotics when not needed can lead to the development of deadly strains of bacteria which are resistant to drugs and cause more than 88,000 deaths per year due to hospital-acquired infections. So this is your E. coli outbreaks that we're hearing about more and more in hospitals. This is the C. difficile outbreaks we're hearing about and Klebs cell infections that pe people are picking up at the hospital. And of course, MRSA superbug. We're seeing increased incidences of staph infection outbreaks in hospitals. So people are going into hospitals feeling bad, and they're sometimes coming out 10 times worse picking up these infections. There's an increase, of course, in chronic inflammatory bowel disease. There are an increase in candida yeast overgrowth. That's the big one we'll talk about today. More comedic relief. This is a magazine for antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Conjugation, does pill size matter? Sexy flagella in only 10 days. Does your host really love you? And it says 16 new antibiotic resistances for this summer. Candida. So the genus Candida includes around 154 species. Among these, four are the most frequently isolated in human infections, and Candida albicans is the most abundant and significant species. So. Dealing with that can often be the missing link in chronic inflammatory bowel disease and digestive disturbances of all kinds. This gentleman is visiting his doctor. The doctor is saying, this has nothing to do with candida or foods creating yeast overgrowth and fermentation in the gut. Your sense of feeling bloated up like a balloon is purely stress-related. Just accept that you'll be on antidepressants for the rest of your life and you'll be fine. So this, this is actually a common scenario where symptoms are overlooked and then misdiagnosis is common. You have a mental disturbance, you have emotional swings, you don't feel right, you can't think right, brain fog, and then you go to see your psychiatrist or your doctor and he says, this is depression, you need to take an antidepressant. All the while, candida yeast overgrowth continues to proliferate and you're not getting to the root cause, you're not changing the diet, changing the milo, which would allow for candida to stay in check and not be its fungal form, which causes all the issues. So candida, again, the byproducts of candida have a neurotoxic effect and they cause symptoms of brain fog and fatigue. So candida mycotoxins are neurotoxic. They poison brain cells. Here are some symptoms of candida overgrowth so that you can see if maybe you do have a candida yeast infection contributing to irritable bowel disease um, and the many digestive issues we're discussing. Allergies, autoimmune conditions, thrush, waking up in the morning with a white coating on the tongue, brain fog, depression, candida of the hands or the feet or of the nails. If you have fungal nails, you may have a candida overgrowth in the bowel. Psoriasis has been linked to candida yeast overgrowth. Candida of the kidney, candida of the stomach, so digestive disturbances are a huge sign that you may have candida overgrowth, usually bloating, especially after a carbohydrate-rich meal or drinking a lot of alcohol. And then candida of the reproductive tract. A lot of women have frequent infections uh, with yeast. So what happens is candida overgrows and overworks the immune system allowing viral and parasitic organisms to infect the body. This is why usually candida doesn't exist without other co-infections, because the same environment which gives rise to candida in its fungal form and favors that growth 
also favors other molds, yeast, and fungus, and pathogenic bacteria. So co-infections are common. The anaerobic ones are just sitting there, but the aerobic bacteria doing jumping jacks, sit-ups, and leg lifts. Candida is an anaerobic bacteria. So let's talk about the solutions. Probiotic basis, basics. When it comes to selecting a probiotic, there are many different strains that might comprise that probiotic. Ideally, you want a probiotic that is as broad spectrum as possible. That means that there are a multitude of different species and strains being used for maximum benefit. Not all strains of bacteria have the same properties. Um, even the strains within the same species can have different properties and therefore very different health benefits. So we want to get a broad range of health benefits from a broad range of strains. Most probiotics are either lactobacilli or bifidobacteria. In brackets, usually beside that, you will then see the strain, um, and it's usually comprised of some numbers and some letters. It's like an acronym in brackets. That's how you know that the strain has been strain identified and clinically proven to survive stomach acidity and bile and colonize in the GI tract. Benefits of taking probiotics include increased immunity. Again, we talked about how much the gut plays a role in the immune system. A lot of that has to do with the bacteria that live there. The synthesis of certain micronutrients happens there. That includes vitamin K2 and B12 manufactured in the gut. Also the creation of certain short chain fatty acids, which increase bowel function and elimination. Short chain fatty acids are the end products of fermentation by dietar of dietary fibers, which humans, us, don't digest and use. So they get fermented by intestinal microbiota and studies show that there's a positive influence when people are administered with these short chain fatty acids, positive influence on ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and antibiotic associated diarrhea. So these good bacteria make these for us. Again, we want to look for a strain identified species, a variety of strain identified species. We want to find a product that is broad spectrum, and we want to find that the strains ideally are supported by human clinical trials. We want the high potency probiotics when we are dealing with an, an intensive care situation. Maybe you have just had a bowel resection surgery or you've just come out of a hospital situation, then you would be doing intensive care. Or if you've done high doses of antibiotics, you want to follow that immediately with a good probiotic of 60 to 100 billion or more. Look for dairy-free, gluten-free, and non-irradiated, so it's free of any potential allergens. And find probiotics, when you can, with L-glutamine in it, because that will heal leaky gut. Just to refresh, leaky gut is found in 7 out of 10 people. Some say 8 in 10 have leaky gut. Um, you may or may not have a diagnosis, but the symptoms are the ones that we discussed, including food allergies and so forth. Um, so we want to actually heal the intestinal tissue while we're introducing probiotics. So the strains have to be able to resist stomach acid and bile. They have to be proven safe. You don't have to worry about that if it's strain identified. That requires identification by proven molecular techniques. And the strains which are supported by human clinical trials are the best. We're going to talk today about one of my favorite strains for chronic inflammatory bowel disease, which is L-acidophilus NCFM strain. So when you're reading your label, um, you can see there underneath the image, L-acidophilus NCFM strain. NCFM will usually be in rackets, and other types of strains that are strain identified and clinically proven to work will also be in brackets like that. That's what it looks like underneath the electron microscope. They are microscopic. This is L-acidophilus adhering to human fetal intestinal cells. So they attach and now that we know that they are colonizing in the gut. They have to adhere to the colon cells or uh, they're otherwise just going right through us. So that's what that looks like under a microscope. L. acidophilus NCFM strain is one of the most strongly researched strain identified probiotics. It's capable of st surviving stomach acidity and what's really cool is it has morphine like effects. What does this mean? It means that it induces the expression of cannabinoid and opioid receptors in the intestinal tract. Um, I found that very compelling when I read the technical memorandum on NCFM strain. Because if you have Crohn's disease, for example, uh, and you're in this room, you may have had a hospital visit, and you know that they 
the pain is so bad, they hook you up to morphine. And then when you are leaving, they write a prescription for Percocet because that's acting on the opioid receptors in the intestinal tract to deal with pain powerfully. The, one of the reasons that marijuana is being studied so much in the natural health world is because it's working on the cannabinoid system of our bodies, which deals with pain. Of course, um, opioid drugs have a lot of side effects. There's actually a Canada-wide opiate addiction right now if you turn on the news. Um, highly, highly addictive stuff. So the fact that L. acidophilus NCFM strain acts on these exact receptors to deal with pain without the side effects means it should be in your tool bag as a preventative measure against those hospital visits or as something that you're including on the track to wean off of um, if you choose to some of these more harsher methods. This uh, strain is also outperforming many of the different species of acidophilus in the fight of candida. I think there's something like over 16 different types of acidophilus. So they have compared NCFM against many of the others, and it seems to do better in terms of attacking candida and reducing their numbers. So we have various human studies, but we also have animal studies. In immune-compromised mice, there was a study done, and they were given experimental candida yeast infection, but they, were, they received protection when they were taking L. acidophilus NCFM strain pro prophylactically, so they did not manifest a full-blown infection. And they compared that to other forms of acidophilus as well. There was also better protection for the mice taking L. acidophilus NCFM strain than those who didn't for systemic candidiasis. So what can happen with a leaky gut is that the candida can then get into the bloodstream and it becomes systemic, and that's how it ends up in the brain, in the kidneys, in the liver, and is circulating throughout the entire body. There's also been an increase, uh, one according to one study, an increase in serum IgG, IgM, IgA, antibodies. Um, so we know that the immune system becomes activated in the presence of L. acidophilus NCFM strain. So that's just one of the strains, but um, again, particularly the morphine impacts, it says in the literature, morphine effects, um, means that you, you may want to look at that. So what are prebiotics? Prebiotics are the types of plant fibers that humans do not create the enzymes to digest. So they're non-digestible plant fibers. However, the good guys in our bowel absolutely love them. They use them as a fuel source, and they ferment them. And they fer their process of fermentation creates many compounds that are beneficial to the human body, like the K2 and the short-chain fatty acids and the B12 that we have discussed. So on a probiotic, you will see things like FOS, fructooligosaccharides. You will see things like inulin fiber. There are key types of fiber that they have an affinity for. So that just means you have a prebiotic that's in your probiotic. It's essentially food for healthy flora. This is a nice little visual. The Pac-Men are eating the prebiotic. The bad bacteria looks like the ghost, and he can't eat that. That's not food for him. So alternatives to antibiotics. Obviously, sometimes you need antibiotics, but again, the danger is overusing them to the point that they don't work anymore, and now you have even stronger pathogenic bacteria um, that you have to deal with. So natural alternatives include olive leaf extract, which has also an antiviral impact. It's also antimicrobial. There are many anti-parasite herbs that are very effective in combination with each other. Black walnut hull, wormwood cloves, and quassa bark. You can usually find these, many of them, in a combination formula. Wild oregano oil, black cumin seed oil. Black cumin seed oil is also anti-tumor. Um, wild oregano oil is anti-parasitic, antiviral, antibacterial. Um, so whatever the infection, it pretty much has what you need to attack that. Homeopathic, if you have the flu, instead of taking antibiotics, you might consider osicillin osinum, um, which is an excellent uh, natural approach. Medicinal mushrooms increase natural killer cell activity, which is a major component of the immune system that fights cancer cells. So we want to increase that activity. Aloe vera gel was known as the herb of immortality by the Egyptians, and it's great for regulating bowel movements. Milk, thistle, and the gut. A lot of times when we think about the gut, we may forget that the liver is known as one of the accessory organs to the digestive system. So is the pancreas. Um, to review your digestive system or your gastrointestinal tract is everything from the mouth to the anus, and it has accessory organs like the liver and the pancreas. 
In the book, The Liver, The Laboratory of the Living, Dr. Leo Roy, a medical doctor, stated that no disease, especially degenerative diseases, could survive longer than a few weeks in the presence of a healthy liver. We'll find out why that could be. There is a link between candida immunity and liver function. Um, if you start with the liver's role in immune system function being compromised, that depressed immunity causes candida overgrowth to get worse. The candida produce yeast byproducts that disrupt liver function further, and it's an endless circle. Or you could start with the diagram with you have a candida yeast overgrowth because of too many antibiotics. They create byproducts, mycotoxins, which disrupt liver function. The liver is not working at full capacity. It has a, a role that it plays in the immune system. The immune system is low, more candida proliferates. So we need to make sure that we take care of the liver uh, if we want a healthy gut. The liver produces chemicals that combat viruses and bacteria. It supports phagocytosis. That's one of its immune system roles. That's cell eating. It eats up pathogens and dead tissue. It produces antihistamines to neutralize carcinogens. It's considered the gateway to disease. So if we don't clean it up, we can't get better. It's key for detoxification and immunity. We discussed that. And it processes nutrients which come in from the intestines and it neutralizes toxins from food. The dangers of a congested liver are that an over liver can cause a backup of toxins into the portal vein, which leads from the intestinal tract directly into the liver. And so rather than toxins being excreted, they wind back up in the intestinal tract, creating an increased toxic, toxic burden within the GI tract. So there's this recycling of poisons. milk thistle. So what can we do about it? There are a lot of different herbs that you can take for the liver. One of the most studied herbs is milk thistle. Um, I think we probably have more studies on this herb for the liver than anything else out there because it's been heavily researched in Germany. Um, so we want to heal the gut with milk thistle. Milk thistle's most active constituent is silymarin. Silymarin can come in a tablet, it can come in a powder, or it can come in a liquid form. In addition to generating new healthy liver cells and stimulating bile production, silymarin has the ability to increase glutathione levels in the liver by as much as 35%. Glutathione uh, production actually declines with age, and it's one of the master detoxifying enzymes that we have at our disposal, and it's considered a life extension molecule. So if we can increase glutathione, we live longer, better, healthier lives. Next, let's talk about the pancreatic enzymes. Pancreatic enzymes were first identified around 1858 in Europe, so a very long time ago, and they were known even back then as essential for normal digestion. They also were studied uh, back then for their anti-cancer benefit. Serapeptase, according to Dr. Zolt Zoltan Rona, who Hopefully you guys will see him talk later today. In his interview about serapeptase, which you can find on YouTube, the ideal most effective proteolytic or protein digesting enzyme is serapeptase. Serapeptase is made by silkworms, and that's a silkworm there that has just emerged from its cocoon. Essentially, the uh, silkworm secretes serapeptase to eat away at the cocoon and emerge as a butterfly. It has a similar function within our own bodies, which is very, very interesting, and we're going to talk about that. So serapeptase, why do you want to take serapeptase as a supplement? It breaks down what are known as biofilms secreted by these pathogenic or microorganisms we've been talking about that are present in disease states like Crohn's, colitis, and celiac. Biofilms are essentially the way that a pathogen protects itself from the immune system. They secrete the substance, it hardens around them, and the immune system can't see them, essentially, and get at them. So serapeptase goes and eats that up, exposes the parasite, the mold, the yeast, and the fungus, and then when you take these antimicrobials uh, that we discussed, it can actually get at that. It eats up undigested food. Undigested food fermenting and putrefying in the gut is a major source of fungal overgrowth. So it will eat that up for us. It fights inflammation of the intestinal mucosa, which relieves pain. The ability of serapeptase to break down scar tissue is significant because if you had any number of bowel resection surgeries, you will have scar tissue. And the presence of scar tissue uh, means that nutrients, blood, and oxygen are blocked off to the digestive organs. 
and they are receiving less nourishment. So we want to work to break that down. There's not a whole lot out there that can break down scar tissue, but serapeptase is one of those things. So in a complete gut healing pro protocol, you want to be doing serapeptase to both heal, break up congestion in the body, digest um, fermenting, putrefying food in the bowel that's food for the pathogens, and you want to control inflammation. Take two to three capsules three times a day on an empty stomach away from food. This is a suggestion, but um, if you feel like you want to take more or less, that is up to working with your healthcare provider. L-glutamine which we did touch on because we said if you can find it in a probiotic, which there are great ones out there, then that just is one less supplement you have to take, two supplements in one. During stress, the body's need for glutamine increases, especially within the digestive tract. This amino acid is the number one fuel source for the intestinal cells, and it's crucial for normal gastrointestinal permeability. You want to take 250 milligrams to 2 grams daily. So even more than sugar, the intestinal cells love glutamine, and they will use it to repair themselves. Colloidal silica gel. Here you have colloidal silica gel from Quartz Crystal. What it does in the bowel is it absorbs toxic debris like a sponge. It, in, it heals the intestinal mucosa, restoring healthy tissues, and it hydrates the colon. It's very water absorbent. Colloidal silica gel is also found in the payers' patches of the small and large intestines. They have a very high silica content, and uh, the greatest store of silica found in the human body is in these glands of the lymphatic system. We also see that silica gel stimulates connective tissue regeneration through the synthesis of collagen throughout the body. So look for silica in the colloidal gel form. It's the most absorbed and highest in bioavailability. Look for 196 milligrams or more per serving and ensure the product is excipient, preservative, and additive free. A lot of liquids today, um, both in, in the food world but also in the supplement world, include excipients, preservatives, and additives that have a toxic impact and increase our toxic burden. Things like polysorbate, AD, and sodium benzoate. Sodium benzoate is a known carcinogen. So avoid that and get a pure product. Um, here we have an increase in cell performance when exposed to colloidal silica, up to 17% increased cell activity in the connective tissue, so an improvement in cellular energy metabolism according to a German study that studied specifically the colloidal gel form, so healthy cells of the digestive tract. Improved cell regeneration, so we know that colloidal silica gel supports the, the healthy regeneration of all cells of the body, and this same study showed an increase of 8% cell vitality in the connective tissues. Let's talk about magnesium. Magnesium is known as the anti-stress mineral. There's a huge correlation between high stress, mental, emotional, financial, physical stress, and magnesium deficiency and also digestive disturbances. So magnesium soothes the central nervous system. It relaxes the muscles of the bowel, which helps you to have healthy elimination and get rid of constipation. It activates melatonin, um, which we need to have a good night's rest. And it's when we're at full rest with the parasympathetic nervous system that our body is actually healing. We don't do very much healing at all when we're in our central nervous system, which is fight or flight. It's a survival mechanism of the body. Controlling inflammation... Oh, with magnesium, take magnesium bisglycinate, not magnesium citrate. If you have IBS, Crohn's colitis, celiac, it could act as an irritant and give you loose stool, um, and it could also maybe not feel so good. So bisglycinate is the best. It's 200% more bioavailable than other forms of magnesium as well. Controlling inflammation naturally is important. And one of the best curcumin extracts that I can recommend is Long Vita Curcumin Extract. This is a patented, multi-patented curcumin product um, that has 16 clinically published studies already done on it and about 17 more yet to be published studies on the way. Here's how it's different. Curcumin 95 extract is the vast majority of curcumin on the market today. Uh, there's like less than five patented ingredients which have worked with the product to increase its 
no notoriously low bioavailability. Notoriously low bioavailability. Um, curcumin comes from turmeric, as many of us might know. It's the active alkaloid which controls inflammation, deals with pain, and modulates the immune system. Longvita uses a patented technology called solid lipid curcumin particle. This technology renders the curcumin free curcumin, which is why it has a high bioavailability, and it's also the only known curcumin which can pass through the blood-brain barrier. We've been talking a lot about the brain-bowel connection, a lot of times with digestive disturbances and chronic inflammatory bowel disease, you can have depression and you have the mental health effects of living with chronic disease. So addressing the depression at the same time by controlling inflammation in the brain is a really good idea. And you just feel good overall. Um, the bioavailability of curcumin, we'll go with the middle figure, it ranges from 67 to 285 times more bioavailable than curcumin-95, depending on which um, instrument they're using to evaluate. So middle of the road, 95 times more bioavailable than curcumin-95 extract. That's a huge comparison. And bioavailability is everything. It's not just the supplements you're taking, it's what you're digesting, assimilating, absorbing, and then using that really counts. Many awesome studies have been done, as I said, um, but in particular, we see that those individuals taking Long Vita have a decrease in C-reactive protein. That is a biomarker. You can get a test for it with your medical doctor. It's a biomarker for chronic inflammation in the body. We also see a decrease in salivary amylase, which is a predictor and an indicator or a biomarker of physiological stress in the body. And we also see in many of their studies an increase in total antioxidant status. This study is from Ohio State University. So controlling inflammation is key. Um, to avoiding those hospital visits as much as possible. Inflammation is the root of all disease as well. Reduce stress. Um, this again has a lot to do with the brain bowel connection. If you're in a stress condition, your body won't heal. You have too much cortisol circulating through the bloodstream. Your body goes into survival mode and it says, we'll heal that later. We'll deal with the immune system later. Let's just survive. So one of the very best ways we can modify and reduce stress is by taking a B complex. We have an increased need for B complex vitamins when we are under stress of any kind. Uh, just having a disease is going to create additional mental, emotional, financial stress. And that impacts on the central nervous system and also impacts on the brain bowel connection. The coenzyme form of B complex is ideal because your body doesn't have to do the conversion. It's more bioavailable in the body to get the coenzyme form of these B-complex vitamins. And you can find that easily in a supplement. It will just literally say bioactive B-complex or coenzyme B-complex. B-complex is essential for cellular energy and repair, neurotransmitter synthesis, and a healthy nervous system function. Anything to do with the nervous system, you need to be taking Bs, and you need to take them on a daily regular basis because you don't store them in the body. Whatever you don't use, you simply eliminate through the urine. Um, so we need to take it every day. There are other nutrients that our body stores. Choose a high potency, especially under stress. Take 50 to 100 milligrams of B-complex daily. Also take adaptogen herbs. Ashwagandha is probably one of the best adaptogen herbs for stress. An adaptogen is any herb that assists the body or any organism in adapting to stressful conditions or a stressful environment. So you have an increased capacity to deal with stress. Because at the end of the day, it's more so our perceptions about what's going on than the actual event itself. One person in one situation could find the environment not stressful at all, and the exact same person in the exact same environment could be freaking out. So we want to increase our ability to adapt to stress, and that's one of the things you can do is take adaptogens. Sensorilla is a patented form of ashwagandha. Ashwagandha, by the way, comes from Ayurvedic medicine, which is a 5,000-year-old unbroken system of medicine, um, which now that we're studying it with modern technology and science, we realize they had it right all along. Sensorial ashwagandha is supported by 10 clinical studies. The roots and the leaves of this type of ashwagandha have a higher withanilide glycoside content. That's the active ingredient that balances out our cortisol, our stress hormone. Um, so this is a multi-patented discovery. And it's clinically proven to balance cortisol, which leads to an improved stress response, better sleep, and a better mood overall. We need to talk about malabsorption. 
When you are um, going the traditional medical route, you can have a reduced bowel surface area due to multiple surgeries, so malabsorption becomes a problem. Intestinal bleeding interferes with absorption, and the presence of pathogens like candida also interfere with the absorption of the nutrition that you're taking. One of the most important supplements to take when you have those diseases is iron,、um, because you have an increase due to intestinal bleeding, passing、uh, blood in the stool, and you have an increased need due to the reduced bowel surface area required for absorption if you have had a surgery or multiple surgeries. Choose plant-based. Choose a liquid. Ensure that it's in a base of B complex with vitamin C. Those are the cofactors. Take 10 mils twice per day. Quickly, we'll go through a few other strategies. Slippery elm bark is known to heal the intestinal mucosa. It's very soothing to the intestinal mucosa. Get eight to ten hours of sleep each night. This is activating the rest and digest parasympathetic response of the body. Again, reduce stress by taking adaptogens and B complex, but also engage in a spiritual practice or meditation or something that works for you. Once the intestinal tract is healed from L-glutamine and slippery elm,、um, and and other measures that we've talked about, you can pr-、uh, pursue colonics and enemas. Do not do colonics and enemas until the bowel is healed through probiotics and L-glutamine mostly re- and dietary change. Reduce alcohol and caffeine intake. You can use castor oil packs on the abdomen or liver for pain.、Um, you can spend time in nature. We'll just quickly touch on dangers of allopathy, and then I'm out of time.、Um, obviously, allopathy is the typical approach most people go. We have to remember, though, that opiate drugs are highly addictive. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, rather than something like Longavita curcumin. Can further aggravate intestinal bleeding because a known side effect of things like ibuprofen is intestinal bleeding. Immunosuppressant drugs suppress the immune system and therefore reduce the infection-fighting capacities of the body and allow candida and other pathogens that are at the root cause to proliferate. So that's the common approach: is、um, medicine will suppress the immune system, which alleviates the symptom, but the root cause remains untouched.、Um, And this can, over time, lead to emaciation. The disease condition is progressing underneath all that symptom control. At the end of the day, prescription medication is toxins. They are toxins. They suppress the immune system and they tax the elimination channels of the body, leading to other surgeries. And surgical interven- interventions, while they may be initially needed, if you continue down that route, they just keep cutting out the de- diseased tissue, and then that diseased tissue spreads to some other. Part and eventually、um, there's a reduced bowel surface area, exacerbation of malabsorption, and some people unfortunately they, ha- they have to wear a bag. We all we all probably know that if we have Crohn's disease. So the ideal is to start to implicate some natural measures and go down a different road, and then you will have a healthy digestive tract like this. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you all coming. And if you have some questions, we can talk at the NACA booth. Have a great day.